our Father and our God, we uh, come before you tonight so um, in awe of your majesty and your holiness and, and your power that you share with us, um, your Holy Spirit that lives in us and um, comforts us and guides us. Um, Father, you are so caring towards us. You provide for all of our needs and especially our greatest need was that of salvation. And um, you provided a savior for us. And we just love you, Lord. Uh, we're so thankful to be able to be here tonight, to be sisters together. Um, we're so thankful for Sheila and uh, her coming our way. Um, we just ask that you'll be with her as she speaks to us. Um, help us to have attentive ears and um, open hearts. Um, Lord, please bless all of us as we travel home. Get us there safely and bring us back tomorrow. Um, we ask this all in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much. I'm so glad everyone of you are here tonight because I know as women that you've had a very busy day today. And I'm sure you're probably tired. And most of the good work that's done in the world is done by tired people. <laughs> that really don't feel like it. And you know that some days you get up and you do not feel like going to work. But you know what? You go to work, don't you? Sometimes you don't feel like going to worship. And you go to worship and you walk out of there like you have just been totally and completely blessed, don't you? We do things that we don't feel like. And that's what makes us different than the world. Because we have an air tank. You know, sometimes people scuba dive, and when you go down under the water in with all those fish, you don't ask the fish how to live, do you? Because you got to have on an air tank, because you have to have your own air to breathe. You can't be like the fish and breathe under the water. We have to have our own air to breathe. And as Christian women, our air that we breathe is the spirit that God puts inside each one of us. And no matter what, we don't have, if you go to the world and ask them how to solve your problems, you're using the wrong air. The air that we need that gives us life as Christian women is in God's word and everything pales in comparison to that, everything. There's no advice that anybody can give you. There's nothing somebody can tell you about your dysfunctional life. Look, has life not been dysfunctional from the time God created Adam and Eve? I mean, let's face it, if I ask how many people in here were from a dysfunctional family, I could raise my own hand. But so could Eve, and so could Ruth, and so could so many of the women in the Bible. So having dysfunction in our life is irrelevant to how we're going to serve the Lord every single day. Now, someone here asked me if I remembered their name tonight, and I thought, oh my, let me see. I couldn't even have told you the month I was here last time. <laughs> Since I was here, um, I did not run again for the Tennessee State Legislature. I've been there eight years, served as majority floor leader. It was something that was a, a wonderful experience. People, and I must say this, even members of the church have badgered me a little bit about being in politics. How can I be a woman and be in politics? I'm going to tell you something from the bottom of my heart. I came out of that situation a stronger Christian than I went in. Now, I'm not going to tell you that would happen to every single person. You are being pulled at every single side. But when you're using that air tank that only matters from above, then you don't have to listen to all of that. You go and you be yourself. And I don't care. People say, well, in politics, that's the biggest place to lose yourself. No, you can lose yourself as a doctor. You can decide that your doctor business is much more important than being a Christian. You can lose yourself as an attorney and decide that you're such a great attorney that you, you need to be doing that instead of being a Christian. No, it is not about what you're involved in. It's about who's inside of you, whatever it is, whatever your job is, whatever you're doing with your life. So since then, I have re retired from that. I don't believe retirement is in a Christian woman's vocabulary. I was just telling her, we pray and pray. Use me up in your service, Father. Use me up in your service. If you don't mean it, don't pray. <laughs> don't. But if you mean it, then you're going to be tired sometimes. And you're going to be used up in his service. And you know what? There is no other way in this world that you're going to have the best retirement ever but to be used up in God's service. You will have the best retirement forever. Mm -hmm. Plus, you get to wear a crown. 
I mean, how many of you have had grandkids? All they want to do is wear a crown and have a microphone. <laughs> you give a little girl a microphone and it transforms her into just a queen and she sings and she dances and, and I learned that in India they quote scripture if you give them a microphone and the little girls in India will if you put a microphone you'll have five of them stand up and sing you a song because they all want to be a part of that and you know what we are God's microphones we are here to let the world know and I don't mean just your little community I mean we're here to let the world know so since I've been here I, I retired from that, but then of course I had to get the person elected that I wanted to take my place, right? <laughs> so I had to speak as much for him as I did for me the first time around when I was elected. Well, then Bill Lee, a friend of ours, decides to run for governor. So we have to help Bill Lee get elected. Now Bill Lee has roots in the Church of Christ. His, his uh, grandparents were members of the church. He goes to a non-denominational church right now, but he is a man who believes in God. He said, as a matter of fact, he was having this huge prayer service. And I text Maria, and I said, oh, Maria, the Freedom From Religion Foundation is going to come to Nashville and say that he can't have that huge prayer service because he's going to be a governor, and that would be the state involved. And I said, Maria, don't pay any attention to them. They're just a bunch of bullies. I said, my son has debated them, and God always wins, and they're just a bunch of bullies trying to make you not have that. And here's the kind of woman she is. She texts me back. She said, oh, Sheila, we would never not have it. She said, this has just given us more advertising. It's going to be bigger than ever. What a fantastic attitude. You know what, ladies? We can't let the bullies win. Don't let the bullies win. If we do, what are we teaching our children? Thank you, that the bullies win. Oh, no, we can't talk about that. They're going to come and sue our school. You know what? Sue the school then. What people don't understand is there are people like Freedom X, the American Center for Law and Justice, the Thomas More Law Center, they will stand up for your school. They'll stand up for your child and they'll do it free of charge because there are enough people who know that we have to fight some things in the courts. It has to be done or we're just going to lose our voice. So we have to do those things. So we had to get the governor elected and we had to get the person from my seat elected. And that was on November 5th were all those elections, so all those people we got elected, then we worked so hard. And then on December 10th, I went to India for 10 days, December 1st through the 10th. And I had never been to India before. But last year, Ricky Gudum, who had been to Free Hard Room with my son, and uh, he kept asking me for three or four years, Sheila, you have to come to India. And this time he said, we're going to have the first polish in the pulpit in India, and we would love for you to come and teach the ladies. So last year, before I really knew I wasn't going to run again, I said, okay, I'll do it. I thought, what am I doing? Yeah. But I said, okay, I'll do it. So my son, about three months later, said, Mother, I heard you're going to India. Now Stan is the preacher at Peachtree City in Atlanta, Georgia. I said, yeah, I'm going to India. He said, are you going by yourself? <laughs> I'm never by myself. <laughs> this is what I cannot get my family to understand. I am never by myself, and I am never afraid. I'm not. The Lord is with me. I feel it every instant, every second of my day. I'm also well armed in most instances. Uh, I could not be that in India, but I still trust in the Lord. Everything's going to be fine. And I said, yes, I'm going by myself. He said, oh. so he called me a couple weeks later. He said, mother, I've talked to Ricky Gudem and I'm going to India with you. <laughs> he said, and I think George is going to go to his wife. So now we've got two lady teachers. <laughs> this worked out great. Yeah, it was fabulous. So George went with me. We taught the ladies. And Stan taught the men. We had 3,500 people come from all around India. Ladies, I wish you could have seen those classes. They have these benches, hard back benches and hard seats, kind of like ours tonight, our little hard seats, you know, <laughs> hard seats. But you know what? They sit on them for hours. And the little girls from the orphanage, they sit on the floor right in front of you. And you could teach for five hours and they wouldn't move. That's how much they want to hear the word of God. It's amazing. And that building there, that building there is not just a church building. It's an orphanage. They have 40 kids in that orphanage who are getting taught the Bible every single day in that building right there. Oh, yes. And when the people came for the meeting, 
They spent the night at the building, sleeping on the floor, sleeping on those hard benches, sleeping anywhere they could sleep because they were going to be there the next morning. And they had to tell the congregations in India, now your congregation can come on Monday night and your congregation can come on Tuesday night because we couldn't have 3,500 people sleeping in the building every night. No, it's not that big a building. But it's amazing how so many places around the world, they are craving the Word of God. They want to hear it. And ladies, there are some things that ladies need to be teaching ladies. Do you know who are the very first converts in most places in the world? It's the women. And I had an eldership tell me not long ago that where they, they have started a congregation and the women come and they leave the husbands at home with the children every week. They said somebody needs to be teaching the ladies their role and their responsibility. And they do. And it's so much easier to hear that from a woman. Now that's the truth. When I became a Christian, Stan and I got married, I was a little bit of a feminist. I mean, I was. I was, gonna, I was for the Equal Rights Amendment. I was going to work toward it. And I mean, I, I was a feminist. The day I got married, my mother gave me the key to her house and said, Honey, when you get ready, you just come home. She never believed I'd live with Stan Butt, not for four months. And I think we just celebrated 47 years, but she didn't think I would live within four months. She said, you just come home, honey, because I was independent. And boy, you know, we'd get our checks together, and he'd want part of my check, pay the bills. And I thought, oh, no, this is never going to happen. And I would get in that shower, and I would sing, I am woman, hear me roar. <laughs> But I couldn't go home because what would my mother say? That's right. I told you you'd never stay married to him. So the first year we were married, I spent lots of nights in a hotel because it, it just wasn't working. But the minister who married us decided that he wanted to teach me the gospel. Brother O'Neill, he married us in the in the Methodist church building, but Stan said, I'd like to have my preacher that I had when I was a little boy. And I said, sure, that'd be fine. So he comes and he knocked on our door and asked if he could come over the next Saturday night. And I said, yeah, that'd be okay. And I figured I had to bake a pie. Preacher's coming over. So he comes over that first Sunday night, uh, first Saturday night, and he and his wife, Miss Dot, and we talked and visited. He said, I just want to show you a little film. I said, okay. So he, he started the Jewel Miller film strip. Uh, came for 13 Saturdays, 13 pies. I mean, every Saturday. <laughs> so after that, I became a Christian. My whole dynamic changed of my marriage, of politics, of everything. Stan always told me that I'm an all or nothing person, and I think that's probably the truth be hard, very hard for me to keep that kind of attitude and be a Christian. It just wasn't going to happen. Because then you see I wanted to serve the Lord. And that's probably why we're still married 47 years later. <laughs> probably why a lot of you are still married too. Because on the day you didn't like your husband, you loved the Lord. <laughs> it makes people stay together on a bad day. Do you know what the divorce rate is in India? One in a thousand. One in a thousand. Can you imagine? Now, are there some hard situations? Yes, I know that there are. Of course there are hard situations. There are hard situations here. I deal with them all the time. I counsel people at Polish in the pulpit. I see women living in hard, hard, hard circumstances. But when you stand before God in judgment, you're not going to count for your husband. You're not going to count for your son. You're not going to count for anybody else. You're going to count for you did in your marriage and how you responded to what happened in your marriage. Because every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess and you will give an account of what you did. So all I'm concerned with is giving an account for what I did in my marriage and my family and my life. Because we want to make excuses. Everybody wants to find a loophole about what the Bible teaches. Everybody's trying to look for an excuse. When you stand in a judgment, is that going to be what you're going to and we need to be teaching women all over the world this. We need to be letting women understand that this is something that he said up there. It's not all about being happy. 
you know, how many of your parents said, we just want you to be happy? Don't you just hear them tell the kids all the time, we just want you to be happy? No, I want you to be in heaven. And if that doesn't mean you're going to be happy every single day, so be it. Because there's nothing that compares to eternity. Nothing. As a matter of fact, Michael Reagan came home one day and he had two goldfish. And his fish, one of his goldfish had died. And he took it to Ronald Reagan. He was just crying. He said, oh, daddy, the goldfish died. And his daddy said, oh, that's okay. It's in goldfish heaven. And you should see goldfish heaven. It has everything a goldfish could ever want. And he talked about goldfish heaven over and over. And finally, Michael Reagan just went and got the fish bowl, took it to his daddy and said, let's just kill the other one. <laughs> <laughs> because if you knew how fantastic heaven was, the stuff that we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, ladies, is nothing in view of spending heaven, eternity in heaven. So this is what we have to give to other women. I mean, it's a gift that you give somebody to help them understand God's will in their life.